This is the first video in a series of videos on theorems and proofs about determinants. I will make the assumption that you have a basic understanding of what a determinant is and how it is computed. And in this first video, what we're going to do is cr cover what I'm calling uh, preliminary notes. So some things that we will need in order to understand and prove the results that are coming. Then we will uh, look at and understand the proof of a theorem on how row operations will change the value of the determinant of a matrix. Uh, that will lead us to a video on this very important result about determinants, which is that a square matrix A is invertible if and only if the determinant is not equal to zero. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with, the, with another very important result about determinants, which is that the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. So we begin with, again, like I said, a couple of preliminary notes that we will need. And I'm calling this notes about cofactor expansion. Uh, and the, what we're going to do is define A sub IJ, so that's a capital A with a subscript IJ, as the IJ cofactor of A which is the matrix found by deleting the ith row and jth column of A. So for example, if I have this three by three matrix and I want to look at the one three cofactor, then that's what I get by crossing out the first row and the third column. The matrix that I'm left with, the two by two, is what's called the cofactor. And I'm going to call that the one three cofactor. Cross out the first row and the third column call that the 1, 3 cofactor. Next thing is that when using cofactor expansion, we think about this matrix that's filled with pluses and minuses. And I want you to notice that whether it's a positive or a negative, that can be determined by this expression right here. So for example, this entry, which I know to be a negative, is in the second row and the third column. So if I added two and three, which would give me five, and negative one to the fifth power is negative, so that tells me that that would end up being a negative value. So that's just a nice way when we're, when we're writing proofs and we're gonna need to be able to determine whether that's positive or negative, we will use this uh, notation as well. Um, that also means that if I wanted to find the determinant of the matrix before, so the matrix from uh, with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I wanted to do cofactor expansion along the first row, then I would take this first entry, right, so the 1, and multiply that by the cofactor that I would get by crossing out the first row and the first column. Then I would get minus the 2, multiplied by the cofactor that was left by crossing out the first row in the second column, and then plus three by, uh, multiplied by the cofactor of the first row and the third column. So with the notation that we've just established, I could write that as the A11 entry times negative one raised to the one plus one, again, the one one entry and one plus one, times the determinant of the A11 cofactor. Then moving along, I see the exact same expression except the second index has moved up to two, and then I get that the, third in, the second index has moved up to three. And of course, I could write that using summation notation, which looks pretty complicated, but it isn't as complicated as it looks. I'm, I'm indexing along the columns, so I've got j going from 1 up to n, the number of columns. Then we're looking at the a i j entry. This is going to determine whether we have positive or negative, and then this is the determinant of the cofactor. Okay, next thing that we will need is to talk about an elementary matrix. And an elementary matrix is one that is obtained by performing a single row operation on the identity matrix. So for example, if I wanted to do the row operation two times row one plus row three is the new row three, then I would uh, do that on the identity matrix, and this is the elementary matrix that I would get. If I wanted to multiply the first row by a constant, like four, then that would give me this matrix. And if I wanted to swap two rows, then I could swap two rows on the identity matrix. 
And elementary matrices are pretty nice because if you multiply a matrix by the elementary matrix that had that one row operation, it's equivalent to doing that one row operation. So I encourage you to check there that I have the elementary matrix that swapped row two and row three, and when I multiply it by this matrix that I keep using in my example, the result is swapping row two and row three in that matrix. So this allows me to, instead of thinking about row operations, I can think about the row operations as being matrix multiplication by one of these elementary matrices. A really important note about elementary matrices is that since every matrix can be reduced to, redu to a reduced row echelon form, then that means that there always exists a set of elementary matrices such that the elementary matrices will reduce the matrix to the reduced row echelon form. Now the order that I have things written here is important. I've written E1 signifying that that would be the first row operation, which means that E1 has to be multiplied by A first. And then E2 is the second row operation, and then so that means that E2 would be multiplied second. So what I see is that the, the way that I would order the row operations, they kind of get reversed when I look at them in the, in the multiplication. And it doesn't even really matter what each one of these row operations are and, uh, and what order that they came in for the result that I'm looking for. Just know that a series of elementary matrices multiplied by a matrix A will reduce it into the reduced row echelon form. Now, if further, it turns out that the reduced row echelon form is the identity, which it isn't always the identity, but when it is the identity, uh, that implies that A is invertible by the invertible matrix theorem. And that means that these elementary matrices are going to reduce A into the identity. And since A is invertible, I can multiply both sides by A inverse. And what I'm getting is the result that I want, which is that A inverse is a product of elementary matrices. So if I've got a matrix A, then the inverse of A is a product of elementary matrices. Now, since A inverse is invertible, and I did actually put a duh in there because, you know, duh, if A inverse is invertible, we can say that any invertible matrix can be written as a product of elementary matrices. That's something that we are going to need in a few minutes. So what we are saying is that if A is invertible, then it can be written as a product of elementary matrices. I am not implying that these are the elementary matrices that reduce A to the identity. In fact, they're the elementary matrices that reduce A inverse to the identity. That's not important to us right now. What we need to know is that as long as A is invertible, I can write it as a product of elementary matrices. We will be using that in one of the proofs that is coming up.